This week, Harley Davidson announced the all new Sportster S, which is a really significant bike for them. It could mark the beginning of the end for the long standing, super popular air cooled Sportster lineup, which was unable to pass European emissions standards last year. But is this new liquid cooled contemporary looking bike worthy of the Sportster name? In this video, we'll go over the engine, chassis, tech, styling, and the price, and how that compares to its closest rivals in order to find out. So let's dive in with the engine, which is probably the biggest departure from previous Sportsters. As a reference point, the 2020 Iron 1200, which is one of the last Sportsters to be available in the UK, made a paltry 66 horsepower at 6,000 RPM and 96 Nm of peak torque. Now that 1200 V-Twin certainly has a lot of character and charm, but it is starting to look a little dated on the spec sheet. In comes the Sportster S, with a huge increase in both power and torque. Push it up to 7,500 RPM and you'll get 121 horsepower. And peak torque also comes in at a whopping 127 newton meters at 6,000 RPM. So how have Harley done it? How have Harley done it? Well, they've taken the much more modern <laughs> Revolution Max engine from their Pan America Adventure bike and adapted it here for the cruiser market. This version is called the Revolution Max 1250T. And I assume the T stands for torque because Harley say that it's been tuned to make tremendous torque at low RPM with a torque curve that stays flat through the power band. Engine performance designed to deliver strong acceleration from a start with robust power through the mid range. So yes, they've sacrificed some top end power as you don't get the full 150 horsepower from the Pan America. But peak torque is produced 750 RPM lower in the revs and there's a 10% increase right down from 3000 RPM up to six. The fundamentals of the Revolution Max 1250T are the same though. It's a 1250cc liquid cooled 60 degree V-twin, four valves per cylinder, double overhead camshaft, and a variable valve timing system to deliver good low end torque, yet with a bit of fun in the high revs. But there are a few key differences that Harley made in order to bring out that low end torquiness. There are new valve and port dimensions, a revised combustion chamber, and new piston shapes to match, all designed with the intention of increasing the velocity of flow through the chamber at low revs. The airbox and intakes, cam profiles, and the variable valve timing system have all had revisions as well in order to boost the low end delivery. And to me, this all sounds pretty good. I've had a decent amount of time riding the Pan America already, and I was definitely impressed with the engine, but more meat in the mid range would certainly be welcome for this style of motorcycle and the top end is less of a concern. The exhaust system is also worth a mention with a high level 2 into 1 into 2 design that gives it a little bit of a flat tracker vibe. It certainly looks cool but in my experience of riding bikes with similar setups like the Triumph Scramblers they can get pretty uncool in slow traffic especially in summer. Perhaps Harley have found a way around this with some clever heat shielding, but it's certainly something I'll be looking out for when I get a chance to review it. Onto the chassis, and whereas the majority of the Harley lineup uses a traditional steel cradle frame to house the engine, the Sports Duress uses the Revolution Max as a stress member, delivering the majority of its structure. It has a smaller front frame element, mid frame, and a tail section that all bolt directly to the powertrain, and the result is a significant weight saving as well as an improvement in rigidity which can lead to more precise handling. So the Sportster S tips the scales at 228 kilograms in running order, which is pretty competitive with other cruisers and modern retros. And for reference, the Iron 1200 comes in at 256 kilograms. So that's almost 30 kilos saved, which is a huge amount and will certainly be noticeable out on the road when you're carving up some corners. In fact, it looks as though Harley have taken the handling pretty seriously across the board with this bike, with a trellis swing arm that uses a cross member for extra rigidity, as well as fully adjustable suspension front and rear. There's a 43 mil Showa upside down fork at the front and a Showa piggyback reservoir shock at the rear, and the damping adjustability of both should allow riders of all sizes and riding styles to optimize the response for the best possible handling. There's also a remote preload adjuster at the rear, normally a convenience for setting the sag of the bike if you sometimes carry a passenger. Now you may note that the bike in the pictures is a single seat setup, but there there is a pillion accessory kit available which includes the seat pegs and a backrest. The wheel
wheels are a lightweight cast aluminium 5-spoke design and shod with some proper chunky Dunlop GT503 tyres. There's a 180x70 on a 16-inch rim at the rear and a 160x70 on a 17-incher at the front. And like the Pan America, braking comes from Brembo with a single 4-part radially mounted monoblock caliper on a 320mm disc at the front and a two-pot caliper on a 260mm disc at the rear. That ought to offer some decent, if not outstanding, stopping power for a bike of this size. And I do like that the brake and clutch levers are adjustable as standard, which can't be said of many of the Harleys. All in all, it's a huge leap on previous Sportsters that typically used Harley's own brand brakes and simple suspension setups without any real adjustability. The equipment on show here puts the Sportster S more so on a par with European nakeds and retros, and I for one can't wait to take one out for a spin. The only exception is that as standard it comes with forward position pegs, and especially on a bike that should like to hustle a bit, I'd prefer mid pegs. They usually offer a more aggressive stance that allows you to get on top of it and move your body around with ease. But fortunately, there's an accessory kit for that too, and that might also be good news for anyone on the short side that struggles with the reach to the forward foot controls. Seat height is also pretty approachable, standing at 753mm, which is much lower than most other types of bike. It is a little taller than many other previous Sportsters, but that extra height has allowed Harley to deliver a maximum lean angle of 34 degrees on either side. Take the Iron 1200 we just just looked at, for example, that bike tops out at 27 degrees on the right and 28 on the left. And anyone who's ridden one at a decent clip will know full well that it's super easy to scrape the pegs. So again, clearly we have a far more performance and handling orientated bike in the Sportster S. Another area in which the Sportsters have always been pretty pared back is the technology, with generally nothing to speak of, apart from ABS with it being mandatory by law. The Sportster S shows that Harley are really catching up, carrying plenty of modern features that are almost a given on other styles of bike now. At the center of it all is a new 4-inch round TFT display, which suits the aesthetic of the bike whilst also offering plenty of techie features. Using the new switchgear, you can cycle through basic riding data, a bike status screen, and paired with a headset, you can control music, phone calls, and also navigation prompts from the Harley-Davidson app. There's cruise control, tire pressure monitoring, and an alarm all fitted as standard, as well as three preset riding modes of road, rain, and sport, and a couple of custom slots to dial in your own settings. Each mode affects the engine map, throttle response, engine braking, and a six-axis inertial measurement unit feeds lean data into the cornering sensitive ABS, traction control, and drag torque slip control. Essentially, Harley have taken the best of the Pan America's features and shrunk the interface down into a smaller screen size. And I reckon that will work pretty well here. You don't necessarily need or want a huge TFT dash on a bike of this style. The less distraction, the better. But to have some of those advanced rider aids working in the background can only lead to better safety. And if you do want to dial them back, then you've got two custom slots to play with. The round dash blends nicely into the rest of the bike with a mix of retro and signature Harley features, whilst also using some modern shapes and finishes. Harley say that in profile, the Sportster S model appears crouched and powerful. The fuel tank and tail section frame the engine as the predominant centerpiece of the motorcycle. The massive front tire recalls the fenderless front end of a classic bobber, while the tail section, high mount exhaust, and slim solo seat draw inspiration from the Harley Davidson XR750 flat tracker. The thick inverted forks and wide profile tyres suggest a high performance sports bike. Possibly getting a bit carried away at the end there, but personally I think they've done a great job of the looks overall. These things are subjective though, so let me know what you think of it down in the comments below. The Sports Duress is available to order right away at Harley dealers with a starting price of £13,999. That looks a little steep compared to previous Sportsters, which could be had for well under 10 grand, and some of its closest rivals like the the Indian Scout Bobber and the Triumph Bobber come in at around 12. But you are getting a heck of a lot more power in this bike, premium suspension and brakes, and significantly more tech. When you compare it feature for feature, the Harley wins in almost every category, so it could well be worth the extra cash. I'll reserve full judgment until I actually get to ride one, and I'll be lining that up as soon as I can. So if you're new here and you want to see that review as soon as it goes live, then hit subscribe, and I'll have the immense pleasure of seeing you then.